we've, we've, we've titled the, the presentation today saying goodbye to Tina. You know, we've gone through a long period um, of repressed yields, repressed volatility, you know, over exuberant central banks um, that have driven many investors into risky assets under the excuse of there's no alternative. Um, and, you know, through the um, volatility of the first half, that, that, that period of time is now gone. There's now opened up a wealth of opportunities and alternatives for investors um, and a lot of attractive opportunities in the global, mar global bond market that I'll walk through. Um, um, you know, there's three key reasons that we hold bonds in portfolios. It's income, it's diversification for the riskier parts of your portfolios, and it's capital preservation. Um, from extremely low levels of interest rates, all three of those are very difficult to do. Um, with an adjustment higher in interest rates, um, all three of those, uh, the prospects for bonds performing a more traditional role um, is a lot stronger. So let me just step through each one of those and, and sort of clarify why that is um, and look at the opportunity set that's opened up. Um, so starting with income, all I've done here is just chart a history of some of the um, yield, historical yields relative to central bank um, inflation targets. You can't really see it, hasn't jumped out really well, but here the one to three percent, I've put just a, the infl a typical central bank inflation target. Some of them target two percent, some two to three, some one to three. Um, but you can see, um, you know, for the first time in many years, high quality bond portfolios now offering yields comfortably above long term um, central bank inflation objectives. Um, so what I've got here um, looking at this correlation is the chart on the left here just charts um, the correlation, you know, if it's positive or negative, relative to long-term inflation. And you can see if inflation expectation, inflation remain anchored around that 2% objective of central banks, bonds typically provide that low or negative correlation to broader asset markets. It's once you move right on the chart and at a sustained high levels of inflation that starts to break down, which is, you know, makes sense. So here's what's priced into financial markets. This isn't a PIMCO forecast. Um, this is what's priced into uh, global bond markets at the moment. So the green line's the RBA, blue line's the Federal Reserve. The dash line's down the bottom is where we were in Christmas um, and since we've had a rapid rise. So if you have a look, financial markets expecting both countries to have policy rates or the cash rate up around 4% by early next year. You know, three and a half to 4%. Um, before the possibility and, and potential of, a, of an easing cycle starting in the back half of 2023, given how restrictive that will be. So that's what's priced in at the moment. And it's important I start there when I talk about capital preservation, because you have to get cash rates beyond that to lose money in um, bond portfolios due to interest rates. Um, and so, you know, we've got an RBA meeting this afternoon. We expect them to hike by 50 basis points. Don't worry if you're holding bonds. It doesn't do anything. It's already priced. Um, RBA have to get rates to 4% or higher by early next year for the RBA and interest rates um, due to cash rate rises to start causing negative returns in bond portfolios. So it's a pretty high hurdle. So let me wrap up and I'll pass over to, to Hugh. But... Um, as I said, so bond markets have already significantly repriced um, and expect further rapid rises in cash rates up to around 4%. Um, so you shouldn't dismiss the value that's already come into the global um, bond market. Um, and bond markets represent much more better value now. And certainly at PIMCO, we've been selectively adding global duration interest rates risks now that, it, now that um, interest rates have reached these levels. Um, and we're much closer to our longer term structural targets, which is the way we're communicating to our clients to think about it. We're not pounding the table and saying, be long bonds, and sell your equities, but we're saying, if you've been underweight bonds, with most, which most Australian investors have been, now is the time to start moving towards your longer term structural targets. Um, you know, we're absolutely in the final stages of the economic expansion. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a better than even probability over the next couple of years that we do end up in a recession. And a lot of that is driven by these tight financial conditions and, and central bank expectations for next year. So it's not an environment where investors should be focusing on reaching for risky assets or reaching for income. You don't have to. You can build resiliency back into portfolios and generate very healthy levels of, of returns and incomes um, in areas of the, the global financial markets where you no longer have to stretch um, is stretch for returns. You know, that period of Tina or there is no alternative is, has passed us and we're in a period of higher interest rates and higher volatility. 
Um, so putting this all together, you know, certainly from our perspective, um, you know, the, the events of the first half of the year, while challenging, certainly mean that bonds can are now in a position, a much more, um, a better position to provide that traditional role for investors of, um, of income generation, diversification and capital preservation. Right. We're coming through a period through to the end of 2020 where you could go out to conferences like these, uh, not just in Australia, but around the world, and every single multi-asset manager, consultant, uh, worth the salt, was saying it's the death of the 60-40. There's no longer a role for fixed income in the portfolios. You've got to push out the risk, uh, the risk curve to be able to get your income. Fixed income isn't going to get it done. Uh, and that's going to be the new normal, the future of uh, a 60-40 and diversified portfolio. It's done. And, and I mean, I guess they were probably running victory laps over the first half of this year to some extent because it did get hammered. It had a really terrible six month period and we've all suffered through that. <coughs> but, uh, but of course now we're having a bit of a reset and it looks like the 60-40 will, will deliver on its promise and, uh, and its goal for a very wide range of investors. The challenge that we're all facing as asset allocators and managers, uh, people who interact with, uh, with clients is that uh, the, the mindset is still not there. There hasn't been a big move on from Tina and there's a lot of education required in this space, I think particularly on the fixed income side, to get people back to that realisation that you can reduce your risk now, get better returns now, uh, and fixed income is going to be a really critical part of, uh, of driving that. In terms of where, you know, bonds is a, a, a broad category of assets. You know, you've got bonds and you've got bonds. Um, you know, we saw high, you know, high yield markets are very different from say where government bonds are today. So I think you've got to be a lot more selective maybe than uh, in the past, uh, but that does create opportunity. Um, and I know from, from our perspective, you know, the bulk of questions we've been getting from our clients has, has been about bonds. And I think trying to get that message across, trying to take a forward looking view on it, because I think there are a lot of clients that are still anchored to the hold zero bonds, sort of, you know, that very binary view of the world. Um, but they are certainly starting to look um, uh, 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 more attractive than they were. I think one of the but that is a very unusual situation. And I think as we've seen bond rates rise, our inclination has certainly been to lengthen duration because we do see that diversification benefit as coming back into play. Uh, certainly in a worst case market environment where we were to get, say, a more severe recessionary outcome, then we would think that uh, bond rates at around three and a half, four percent would give you quite a reasonable capital buffer offsetting the risks that you have in your equity portfolio. I think the challenge is, of course, uh, the other scenario that we were talking about, um, which is that inflation remains elevated. And I think the, the chart that you showed that, uh, you know, the distribution scattergram that showed that the really worst environment for bonds and equity markets is where you get that material and elongated uplift in inflation. And if that was to occur, then I think you could see that that uh, would still challenge the diversification argument. But barring that sort of outcome, we certainly agree that uh, diversification is, I think, a more relevant consideration, that bonds have a greater role to play in that and have been lengthening duration. Not prepared to go fully long and take on a conventional duration structure within portfolios, but we've made, if you like, baby steps out along the duration curve to reflect what we've seen in market performance. Yep. So look, we've, I guess in terms of the building blocks, at a, at a very high level, we've always sort of looked at it, the three broad components and sort of say, what's my duration exposure, credit exposure, and then I guess the other one is more your absolute return type exposure. And um, so we, we've never been in the camp that you sort of zero duration and, then so, you know, like extreme sort of views. Uh, I, I guess on a broad asset class level, yes, we've been underweight. But within that, we've been pretty diversified with a bias probably to, to, to shorter duration type assets overall. Um, what we're thinking about at the moment is, is in terms of that mix is whether we trim some of that absolute return exposure and, and, and allocate some of that towards um, uh, some of those duration assets. Um, I think in terms of some of the more, um, I guess, spicier end of the, of the fixed income market, um, We've, we've tended to sort of never be, be big proponents of that. And if we have allocated, we've allocated more in that growth part of the portfolio because those assets are more correlated to 
to, to certainly to growth assets than they are to fixed income. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll take a different, or add a different perspective because there is a lot of concern that inflation expectations will ratchet higher and we might be moving to a, a lengthy secular period where inflation is at the top end or maybe a bit above central bank targets and there's a lot of discussion out there about what should the central target be, should we just accept it, uh, it should be a percent higher or so, that's a real challenge. I think, I mean, I, I think there's probably a good scenario to think about where the, the types of drivers of secular stagnation that PIMCO used to speak about a lot that were very widely accepted, I think very sensible, uh, debt and demographics being two of those, could severely outweigh the impact of deglobalization. Uh, and I think part of that is, uh, is showing through in wage growth that is still pretty weak, at least in Australia, relative, relative to where you might have otherwise expected given the inflationary outlook. I, I, I think we could be looking at a cyclical bout of inflation that maybe lasts longer than people think about cyclical, two years or so, but if we go out five years, inflation could actually be at the bottom end of central bank targets. It's not, uh, it's not in my view, a tail scenario at all. And, um, and, and something that is perhaps being under-considered because we're so focused on, on the higher inflation environment right now. In like two sentences, what are you doing with your fixed interest portfolios? Maybe in terms of duration, credit, has it changed? Isaac, I'll start with you. Yeah, we've, we've moved to neutral uh, on our strategic weights for duration and we've shifted our credit quality up towards investment grade. Not too dissimilar actually. So shifting, adding some duration into portfolios, getting closer to long-term structural targets. Um, you know, being very focused on opportunities in the global credit market, but selectively, um, you know, making sure as we pivot into a year next year that is, um, you know, recession risks are heightened, um, they're in the high quality, more resilient end of the capital structure. Mm -hmm. One second left. Uh... Oh, sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, still slightly underweight, um, broadly fixed income, but we are having that discussion at the moment in terms of duration. Mm -hmm. What he said. Um, um, We've been, we're probably about 60% of the way along the duration curve now, having been uh, a lot shorter than that. Um, you know, we'll keep monitoring it, but probably want to see a bit more uh, uplift in yields before going a bit further yet. Um, but, uh, you know, have, have certainly uh, looked to maintain exposure to absolute return type strategies where the, you know, the managers have got a lot of flexibility in their duration management and their credit management. I think that's still a worthwhile uh, part in a portfolio.